Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for giving up your valuable lunch hour. Um, I chose this topic for today's lecture because of data like this. It comes from, I think, an Ipsos Mori poll, and it shows how the public regard a range of occupations, professions, whether they trust them or not. And we see here a public not quite sure whether to trust lawyers or not. And I thought it would be interesting just to think a bit about why that might be. Of course, it's commonly said trust is generally in decline, especially for what are traditionally regarded as elite groups. Uh, but I'm not here to say that generally lawyers should not be trusted. Um, uh, but I am here to explore ways in which lawyers can be improved, trusted more in their role as guardians of the interests of justice. And therefore, I am going to suggest some problem areas where perhaps they haven't behaved in quite as good a way as they might be expected to have done. I suspect one of the reasons why lawyers provoke this split response in public trust is, uh, that, they, uh, is that the public mistrust lawyers who represent people believed to be or perceived to be guilty. Uh, and I'll explore a little bit of, of that in relation to two very famous recent cases uh, and explain why up to a point lawyers are obliged to be zealous advocates for their client. Uh, I'll explore those reasons but also express some concerns about how the way that plays out in court or has done in those particular cases. In the, I didn't mean that to happen yet. Uh, in the second half of the lecture, I'll look at this idea of zealous lawyering in another context, away from the courtroom, uh, in or close to the boardroom. And here I suggest that the recent rash of problem cases, which I'll talk about, puts us on notice of a problem. Commercial lawyers perhaps increasingly being too close to their clients, too prone to take risks in law, far too clever in their management of the truth. And I'll suggest that functioning legal, commercial and social systems depend on trustworthy professionals, depend on trustworthy lawyers. And these cases suggest that trust can and indeed may have sometimes broken down. Now, of course, historically, uh, lawyers have been poorly regarded. It's, it's fun for writers to take pot shots at lawyers. Here we see Samuel Johnson sticking the knife in to a man he believes may have been an attorney. You'll all be familiar with the Shakespearean let's kill all the lawyers quote. Uh, here's a much more recent and troubling example. Uh, John Wu, a former assistant attorney general uh, working in the White House, best known for the so-called torture memos where torture was justified as an enhanced interrogation technique. Uh, this is our first example of lawyers doing what the client wants, stretching, if you like, the law and the facts to achieve the client's desired result. And the Department of Defense uh, in the United States were able to justify their... I don't know why it's doing that, sorry. Able to justify their torture of detainees... Uh, 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 whilst any lawyer involved is simply able to claim they're just doing their job, they're just providing legal advice. A client takes responsibility, so the lawyer says, for any moral qualms about their legal advice. Importantly, and I emphasise this, both the lawyer and the client benefit from each other's non-accountability. The client can say, the lawyer said I could do it. Well, is this really a problem? Is this simply something which has gone on in the United States in relation to a spectacular and unusual case, or is it something we need to worry about more broadly? If we're to look at trust more broadly, we need to look at a number of different tensions between the lawyer, uh, lawyer's self-interest, the needs of the justice system, and the client's interests. We don't really have time for that today. Uh, we could look at uh, whether we trust lawyers not to overcharge us. My research on lawyers' costs suggests the public expect a degree of exploitation from lawyers here, for instance. We could look at whether lawyers provide professional standards of quality. I'm giving another lecture later next month to look at those kinds of problems. Here, what I want to do is focus on the tension between the client's interests and the public interest in the administration of justice. Where these interests conflict, which of these balls, if you like, that the lawyer juggles gets dropped first, or which comes first. Now, to return to what the public thinks, they tend to think of lawyers as being well qualified. They don't think of their education as being a problem. Uh, but interestingly, confidence that lawyers act in their best interest plummets. Interesting because that's one of the key duties of a lawyer to act in their client's uh, best interest. Now, I, respect, I suspect that public perceptions here are partly formed by a degree of ignorance. 
many of the people who respond to, if you like, a general survey may not have had direct experience of lawyers or may have done so only in the context of something like buying or selling a house where, if I can put it gently, the legal profession may not be seen at its best. Interestingly also, though, their tendency not to see lawyers as likely to act ethically, slightly worse even than the acting in the client's interests. Why might that um, be, particularly uh, if we think uh, about the profession's own regard. Uh, professions typically think of themselves uh, 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 very positively in terms of their own ethicality. I happened upon two nice quotes from accountants. I could have found quotes from pretty much any professional leader as to the powerful appeal of this idea of professionalism, something to which all occupations aspire. We probably ourselves aspire to be professional. Should we in some ways be cautious about that uh, central idea. Well, Marion Kuchaki, and I've given the uh, name of the article there, has done a very interesting piece of research where she conducts experiments on students. And what she does is she primes half of the students that she researches to think of themselves as ordinary employees. They're given a story which they're asked to read, think themselves into, and the person is just discussed as an ordinary employee. And the other half given the same story, but that same person is labelled as a professional in some way. And then she gives them tasks to do with an opposite number, an opponent or somebody that they're supposed to be helping. And those tasks are, in fact, tests of their ethicality. Do they behave honestly? Do they cheat in those tests? And she's able, therefore, to, to, to uh, test out whether the students primed to think of themselves as employees behave more or less ethically than the students primed to think of themselves as professionals. Now, unfortunately, for those of us who like to think of ourselves as professionals, the ones primed to think of themselves as professionals are more likely to cheat in the tests. Uh, and they're not entirely insignificant experiments because actually some money rides on the outcome. And the interesting argument that Kuchaki runs is that believing ourselves to be more ethical, these students then become, uh, perhaps unconsciously, actually less so. They become a bit more complacent about their own ethicality. Now, a general test of that kind is interesting, but not conclusive. Uh, after all, professions put significant effort into educating, socialising, and sometimes regulating their members. They produce codes of conduct. Here we see the principles uh, from the bars code of conduct. They emphasize things like duties of honesty, integrity, independence, and so on. And here it's worth noting that the, the first obligation is the primary one, where any of these duties come into conflict. The obligation to the court in the administration of justice is what takes precedence, at least in theory. So how do those principles play out in practice? Well, as I've mentioned, public mistrust of lawyers is probably infected by a broader mistrust of the criminal justice system. As soon as any student declares an interest in being a lawyer, they are then re regularly besieged by friends, uh, family, complete strangers in pubs and the like, with the question, how could you defend a guilty man? Could you defend a guilty man? Uh, and there is also the more interesting question of, and what would you do in your defense of that guilty man? Now, uh, I suspect that many of you will recognize these two uh, faces, the gentleman on the left, is Mr. Jeffrey Samuels, QC. He was counsel for Mr. Levi Belfield. Levi Belfield is the convicted killer of Millie Dowler. And many of you will also perhaps remember the criticism of Mr. Dan, uh, Samuels, particularly from uh, Millie Dowler's family, for the way in which cross-examination was conducted in court. And Millie Dowler's father, in particular, subject to uh, a detailed cross-examination on his past, and there is the suggestion that Mr. Samuels also dwelt on uh, the possibility that Mr. Dowler may have been a police suspect uh, in the case originally, raising the implication that um, perhaps he was the real killer, or that if the police got it wrong once, then perhaps they can do it again. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we must also remember the people, uh, people that people need high-quality defence, uh, particularly those wrongly accused of crimes. Uh, the criminal justice system sometimes has seen a given vent to prejudice against outsiders. There is, prosecutions often take place within a political and public clamoring for action in the face of, for instance, terrorist atrocity. 
and some, sometimes there is uh, an, an uh, um, uh, uncritical acceptance of uh, expert evidence. This can lead to mass miscarriages of justice, as it appears to have done in all of these three cases. Good quality defense is one significant barrier against that, and it is from that that we get the defense lawyer's role morality, the idea that the mighty state prosecutes powerless individuals and that somebody needs to, uh, needs to uh, stand uh, beside the defendant and to defend them against accusations. They also need to overcome, if you like, the bias that's thought to exist amongst ordinary jury members, that there is no smoke without fire, uh, uh, that somebody needs to help counteract that particular problem. And it's from that that this idea that the defence barrister is entitled to defend clients by all means and expedience. This is a quote that comes from the trial of Queen Caroline and is seen as justifying uh, torment and destruction even on innocent defence witnesses. Quite a, uh, a, a vivid, uh, destructive idea, if you like, of zealous advocacy. And something of that has made its way into the code of conduct. So here we have a passage from the Bar's Code of Conduct. Powerful language again, emphasizing the need of the advocate to be fearless in the defense of their client, as long as they do so by all proper and lawful uh, means. And if it needs further emphasis, the case law also states that it's client's duty to fearlessly raise every issue, advance every argument, ask every question, however distasteful, which he thinks will help his client's case, which the barrister thinks will help the client's case. But that does not uh, um, mean that the lawyer doesn't take personal responsibility for conduct and presentation. They have to form a personal judgment upon the substance and purpose of the statements they make, the questions that they ask on the client's behalf. Now, of course, one of those, the limits of what the barrister can do or the advocate can do is that they cannot mislead the court. They cannot make submissions, ask questions, call evidence which they know or are instructed, told by their client, is untrue or misleading. Uh, but of course, that's quite a narrow uh, restriction on what can be done, particularly where a client is carefully handled or a client is experienced so that they know not to make damaging admissions to a lawyer. And what, the client, what the lawyer actually knows uh, to be untrue or misleading can be rather limited. Uh, the second issue is the guilty client problem. The rules state clearly that uh, it is improper there where the client is known to be guilty, where the client has essentially confessed to their lawyer. Uh, it is improper for the, uh, uh, the barrister to raise a positive case, uh, advance a positive defence for the client. They can criticise the prosecution evidence. They can cross-examine the prosecution evidence, but they cannot create a positive case suggesting that their client did not commit the crime. So in Levi Belfield's case, we do not know what his instructions were. We do not know whether he admitted his guilt or not. We can suspect from what happened that he did not do so. Uh, and therefore, we have no basis for questioning the cross-examination of Millie's, Millie Dowler's father under the rules. We might be deeply and positive that this positive case has been advanced, uh, suggesting that perhaps Mr. Dowler might be to blame. Um, uh, and we might be especially uncomfortable that Levi Belfield didn't give evidence, but we can't say on the facts as known that the rules were breached. It's an example, if you like, of the, the extent to which zealous advocacy can be taken, probably legitimately, within the rules. Here's the second case, also a very recent case, also uh, very um, well known and uh, uh, with tragic circumstances. This is the case of Frances Andrade. She committed suicide before the verdict in her case was given. She was a witness in a case uh, alleging indecent assault and rape. After her death, her assailant was convicted on specimen counts of indecent assault whilst Ms. Andrade was a child, but not of rape. And her husband publicly linked her suicide to the cross-examination that incurred in court by um, Kate Backwell, QC. Now, <clears throat> the computer is dying for me to show you the cross-examination more quickly, but I need to emphasize this before we look at it. Some of the exchanges were reported in the newspapers, so we can gain a sense of how cross-examination may have occurred. We don't have the full transcript here, so we need to, need, to treat, need to treat it with a bit of circumspection. But it's an interesting example, if you like, of the kind of thing that goes on in courts. And as you read through the questions, uh, I just encourage you to think about this. Here an interesting question is whether this approach 
is designed to explore and test the evidence or not? Is it trying to do something else? In particular, is the witness being asked questions or is the barrister repeatedly trying to make points for the benefit of the jury? And more broadly, more thoughtfully perhaps, is this the best way known to us of exposing the truth? A larger question. Now we should also note that the judge defended the cross-examination uh, at the end of the case as perfectly proper and correct. Uh, but I think that if this is correctly reported, it is possible to see some concerns in the way this cross-examination was reported. Why do I say that? Well, I turn for support here to a judgment of the then most senior criminal judge in the land, the Lord Chief Justice, in his outgoing judgment, his final judgment. Uh, this was a case about a terrorist suspect. The case is called Faruqi, uh, and it's a case which contains a number of criticisms of the defence uh, barrister. Uh, the judge also, though, I don't want to go into those um, here today, but the judge also makes general comments about advocacy, which we might well apply to the Andrade case. So we see here the judge saying that assertion is a form of questioning which ought to be avoided. Uh, it's unfair to the jury, he says, and in turns suggests it may risk misleading or blurring the lines. He also acknowledges that, that he's, he sees this, at least, as a burgeoning problem. Things are getting worse. Judges have started to allow questioning which they ought not to allow, and advocates have been brought up in this culture, trained in this culture of overly adversarial cross-examination, which is not, in fact, examining the evidence, but the making of points, at least on one interpretation. So clearly this senior judge sees there as being a problem, and he deprecates it. But we, we see nothing further. We see no consequences arising uh, uh, from it in relation to the Andrade case, at least as far as we know. I think there is an argument, at least, that it could have gone farther. Uh, the Bar's Code of Conduct explicitly prohibits the expression of personal opinion and assertion as a matter of fact uh, in a court of law, unless they're explicitly asked uh, to do so. And the question is then whether we see the form of questioning that was employed as questioning or simply assertion. But I also wanted to emphasize there's a second way of looking at this um, process. So this is a, the title of a study published by the British Psychological Association, which looks at this idea of human memory. What does honest human memory look at look like? And suggests a number of things, including some of the ones up on the screen. So memory is not like a recording, understandably. It's not a narrative. It's not straightforward and linear. It's error prone and easily influenced by interviews, by cross-examination. Accounts without gaps are highly unusual. We would expect in an honest account of truth to see gaps. Certain specifics can be expected to be missing. High detail from long-term memory is very rare. And yet, a competent barrister would be expected to seize on some of those things, gaps in evidence, for instance, as potential evidence of uh, uh, evidence being weak or even uh, dishonest, dishonest. So we're entitled to ask the question whether uh, or, uh, th there's a kind of clash, if you like, of two expertises here, the way that barristers ask questions and the way that psychologists see the truth. And, and there will come a point when the questions that lawyers ask in the courtroom cease to be trustable. But we don't really know when that point is, uh, is reached. We have to rely on the judge to make those interventions. And sometimes, we've, as we've seen, the Lord Chief Justice suggesting judges are not making those interventions. But I wanted to turn to the second half. What about when there is no judge? If we've seen this problem of the zealous mindset developing uh, in the courts, what about when there is no judge there to, if you like, umpire the rules of the game? Uh, what potential does that have to create problems? And we turn to this idea of the reputational intermediary. Lawyers often act as in reputational intermediaries. Uh, they're asked to give opinions, to investigate matters for their uh, client, uh, 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 and those opinions or investigations are often used to persuade other of the good faith of the client, the fair dealing of the client, uh, and so on. Uh, now, there's an interesting question is whether lawyers in this situation are independent professionals or are, in fact, hired guns. Is their word their bond, or are they shooting to kill on behalf of their client? Can they act independently? Well, psychological literature around things like accountants suggests that professionals really struggle to act independently in those situations. But let's look at some case studies. Here's the first one, uh, the financial collapse. And one of the pieces that I've worked on here with David Kershaw and the articles given at the bottom right there is a piece around Lehman Brothers. And this is a very finely balanced case where we don't know all of the facts. And it raises an interesting 
question of responsibility and accountability here. So Lehman Brothers needed an opinion to argue that a p particular piece of financial engineering was legitimate in accounting terms. And part of that process required them to get an opinion that that piece of financial engineering, a repo as it was called, was a true sale at English law. And they asked this firm of solicitors, Linklaters, to give that opinion. And they gave the opinion that they were asked to give, perhaps unsurprisingly, because at English law, the, police of the piece of financial engineering was indeed probably a true sale. There's no suggestion that the advice was uh, wrong or incompetent or negligent. But the interesting question, uh, and then what happened is that Lehman Brothers uses that one piece, that, that, that part of the opinion, that part of the puzzle, the opinion, uh, to say that the broader tests have been also been satisfied. There's a kind of taking the opinion in its narrow context and using it in a wider context within the company to say, right, we can use this uh, to use the piece of financial engineering to manage our quarterly management accounts. And we were talking about substantial sums of debt being moved off the balance sheets for the quarterly accounts. Now, an interesting question here is, do the lawyers take any responsibility for that problem? Uh, we do not know whether the solicitors understood that that was what the client was trying to do, and we do not know whether, the, if they did understand that, they did, did anything to reassure themselves that the client was doing uh, or not doing something in, improper. But it raises that interesting question of uh, uh, responsibility in quite acute uh, 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 form. Uh, this, my second example is the case of Nightjack. Those, n many of you may know Nightjack was the name of a police officer blog where he was discussing his experiences as a serving police officer under the cloak of anonymity. There was a lot of interest generated in this. Obviously, there was a question as to whether or not what he was doing was in the broader public interest or, or, or whether he should be revealing information which would be confidential to his uh, police force. The, a reporter from the Times newspaper wanted to establish, get the story, get the scoop on, if you like, who Nightjack was. And his, uh, one of the steps he took in that, one of the first steps he took in relation to that was to hack into Nightjack's email and establish that Nightjack was, in fact, a, a gentleman called DC Horton. He goes to his line manager to explain he's got the scoop on Nightjack, and his line, line manager takes him to see the newspaper's lawyer to advise that this story has been uh, uh, secured by means of hacking into somebody else's email. Uh, if the evidence is accepted of the encounter, the uh, lawyer goes ballistic uh, about the way that this story has been achieved. Uh, but after having given the journalist something of a dressing down, he then, uh, they then discuss what to be done next and how to make the story a legitimate one, and the position arrived at is that if the journalist can find Nightjack's identity by legitimate means, the story can probably be published. So that's what the journalist then goes and does. He knows the identity of Nightjack, and because he knows who Nightjack is, he finds it relatively easy to piece together public information and identify a DC Horton. He then fronts up, is, uh, to use the vernacular, DC Horton says, we think you're Nightjack, what have you got to say about that? DC Horton kind of half admits, but doesn't uh, admit totally that it is him, uh, at, runs off to a solicitor and seeks an injunction preventing the Times from publishing the story on the basis that it's a breach of his privacy. The Times decide to contest that injunction. And here is where the crucial role of the lawyer comes into being, their role as a reputational intermediary. The uh, uh, injunction uh, uh, decision was uh, contested on the basis of affidavit evidence. That's evidence written down and sworn. There is no cross-examination of that affidavit evidence. The court relies on it as written. And the journalist's affidavit, as is normal, uh, was drafted by uh, the in-house lawyer at the Times, Alistair uh, Brett. And that in affidavit implies or states, depending on how uh, you read it, that the journalist began the process of trying to identify Nightjack through legitimate means. There is no mention of hacking. I began by, is the way the, way the, uh, the affidavit is, uh, written, uh, is written. And so what we um, see there is uh, 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 a newspaper lawyer not wanting to reveal criminal behavior by his client's employee, 
and persuading himself that he is justified in suggesting that the, the journalist began his search legitimately or carried out his search legitimately when plainly the journalist began the search in an illegitimate way. Leveson or Justice Leveson at his inquiry appeared to think that he was misled uh, and indeed the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal in suspending Alastair Brett agreed that the court had been misled. The desire to put the best gloss on a bad situation crossed, if you like, from legitimate advocacy into professional misconduct. My second case uh, study to look at, uh, one playing out in the courts, I'm not going to focus directly on, um, on that, but to look again at the role of lawyers in this particular case. And here it's interesting to me that there are four lawyers involved, two from private practice, different firms, two in-houses connected with the newspaper. To give you a kind of synopsis of the uh, facts, Clive Goodl Goodman was the journalist imprisoned for hacking. When he comes out of prison, he's dismissed by the News of the World. Uh, Goodman alleges that he's been unfairly dismissed uh, and uh, specifically that others in the newspaper knew and supported uh, him in his hacking, uh, senior, senior people in the paper, and also that hacking was widespread at the newspaper or more widespread than just him. John Pat Chapman, one of the in-house lawyers connected with the newspaper, uh, commissions Lawrence Abramson, a, a private practitioner in a firm of solicitors, to conduct an independent investigation of a batch of about, we think, 2,500 emails uh, into whether or not there is anything in Goodman's allegations within those emails. Uh, Abramson says not, and we'll look more closely at that in a, a minute. That report that the emails don't support Goodman's contentions is then used in evidence given by Tom Crone and Colin Myler, then the editor of the News of the World, to a parliamentary select committee given as evidence uh, 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 in support of the claim that there's no hard evidence to support allegations of more widespread uh, hacking. Now, the final part of this kind of interesting tale from the point of view of the lawyer's involvement is that a partner in Farrer's well-known firm of solicitors, Julian Pike, acting for the newspaper, uh, 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 in relation to other hacking cases, says that at the time this evidence was given, he knew it was not true. He doesn't intervene, although there's a question as to whether he would really need to or not, but subsequently Panorama threatened to make a program suggesting executives knew that evidence given that it was just one rogue journalist was false, and Mr. Pike threatens them on his client's behalf with a libel suit, even though he knew that actually there was some truth in those allegations. Now, I'm not interested here in here in exploring uh, dishonesty or criminality uh, that may have gone here on here. What I want to focus on is the shifting boundary between advocacy and the lawyer's role as reputational intermediary. So I'm going to focus on uh, Lawrence Abramson. Uh, this is the email, that, or part of the email, that uh, Chapman sent to Abramson to conduct the uh, investigation. If you quickly scan through that, the two things that I would particularly draw your attention to is that Chapman asks for an independent review. It's supposed to be an independent review, consistent with this idea that you're a lawyer, you review it independently for us, we can reassure ourselves or anybody else that there is nothing to hide here. And he asks for any material to be exposed that could possibly support Mr. Goodman's contentions. That's how it's put. Now, where we end up is here. I'm hoping you can read that. Uh, it's not a brilliant copy. Uh, and we see immediately that this is, uh, this is uh, a uh, suggested um, opinion from Mr. Abramson uh, with suggested amendments from Mr. Chapman. Uh, this isn't what finally happened, but it gives you a flavour of what was going on. Uh, and we see immediately the idea that the review was independent, somewhat undermined by the client having the opportunity to comment on the findings of that review and suggest amendments. Uh, and notice that also that we've gone from looking for evidence that tends to support Goodman to evidence which appears to us to prove that Goodman was right in his allegations, suggesting perhaps there was evidence which tended to support, but not evidence which tended to, to prove. Fine distinction. We're not sure whether that's important or not. Notice also that Mr. Ab Abramson declines to say the final sentence from equally at the bottom there, equally having seen. He declines to say that he did not find anything relevant to the grounds of appeal put forward by Mr. Uh, Goodman. He has some concerns about things which are said, or which are in the emails, and he, con he conveys those concerns privately to Mr. Chapman. The basic thrust of those being they're not directly relevant to 
attacking, he says, but uh, suggests broader concerns, but also implies at least, because he's not willing to say that sentence, that they are in some way relevant to Goodman's defence. Now here, no doubt, uh, Mr Abramson is trying to be helpful to his client. Yet he knows, I would suggest, of the likelihood that this advice, this written advice, will pass further up the food chain within the organisation. His client is the organisation, not Mr Chapman. And the organisation, not Mr Chapman, needs to know of the problems. He also seems aware of the possibility, that his, uh, from his other evidence, that he'll be, his opinion will be used in the employment dispute between Mr Goodman and his employer. So he'll, he'll be, his opinion may be used to reassure Goodman that there isn't any evidence to support his claims in the emails. Um, uh, what he probably shouldn't have foreseen, because I think it wasn't uh, something which he could have expected at, at that stage, was his opinion would be used before a parliamentary select committee. It would be unfair to expect uh, him to have predicted that. But he would have been aware that his, quote, independent advice, quotes, has become a piece of advocacy within the context of an employment dispute. Uh, and unfortunately for him and for us and for News International, it was then misused by his client, possibly within the client. Why do I say that? Because Rupert Mur Murdoch claims or is able to say this. And what he says is consistent with uh, the story as I've retold it. Uh, we were misinformed and shielded from anything that was going on there. I do blame one or two people. There's no question in my mind. Certainly, somebody took charge of a cover-up, which we were victim to. We don't know who took charge. We, do, we don't know who to mistrust, but we know, we can see that something went on. Now, I'm not suggesting that Mr. Abramson is a bad apple. Far from it. In fact, I see his approach symptomatic of being symptomatic of a broader trend. Lawyers are encouraged to be business focused. They are encouraged to do what the client wants with mantras such as client first was bred into me. It sounds quite noble. They sell themselves and build their reputations around the idea that their advice is tailored to commercial consequences and contexts. Lawyers are explicitly discouraged from saying no to the client when the law forbids it. Rather, they would say, this is how we can achieve your aim, minimising the risk of legal problems down the track. Now, um, the, uh, the, the, the two cases I've talked about are not the only cases. So to give you a brief flavour of uh, three other recent cases, Standard Chartered Bank uh, accused of by an American regulator and fined for concealing the, if I can put it this way, Iranianness of payments made to the bank. Uh, and they concealed it to avoid detection by US regulators. Now they say the payments may have been lawful for the most part, uh, and they, there is a slim argument that their approach to uh, not revealing, if you like, the identity of the payments or concealing it was lawful. But correspondence within the bank attached to the prosecutor's order suggests that in-house uh, and outside lawyers had advised on the, the approach and advised that it was either probably not or definitely not lawful. Um, in a court, a lawyer is permitted to run weak arguments because their opponent and the judge gets to test it out. Um, but should a lawyer be able to do so in this kind of context is an interesting question. Should they bear some responsibility for assisting, for assisting with acts which are potentially serious uh, and uh, probably, on their own advice, unlawful. The Clifford Chance case, also another interesting recent case. Here they were severely criticised by a judge very recently for arguing uh, that a client's opponent had committed fraud on the basis of allegations which the judge said found were without foundation. Now, if the judge is right in that judgment, that the allegations were without foundation, then there is the potential that the Clifford Chance partner involved has been in breach of the rule that requires him only to make allegations of fraud where they have material which, reasonably, which they reasonably believe, the lawyer has to reasonably believe the material shows on the face of it a case of fraud. The judge is saying effectively the evidence simply wasn't there. And it's worth noting in passing that actually the, for the lawyer to make that kind of allegation, they have to pass a higher test than they would have to do if they were alleging that a female rape victim is lying. Now, the consequences of making those kinds of allegations in court uh, are, of course, very serious. 
uh, there is a case for saying that they are, are given a veneer of truth by the fact they are made by professional lawyers uh, standing up with their own reputations partly on the line uh, and making those kinds of Im implications. And there is certainly a case that making such allegations are likely to impact on a client's opponent. There are real consequences from making those kinds of allegations. So we, we would be right to think that this is the kind of allegation with which we should have a serious concern. The final example is in some ways, for me, the most extraordinary. Uh, Alan Overy, again, a, very, uh, a firm with a very strong reputation, one of the Magic Circle law firms, has been accused uh, by a prosecuting counsel in a serious bribery case, which subsequently collapsed, of pressuring a witness to change their evidence um, prior to a, a, a serious criminal trial. Uh, the full facts of that haven't been uh, 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 given, they haven't been tested in evidence, but that a prosecutor would make, make such an allegation uh, is a serious indication of a potential um, problem. Perhaps suggesting that even the largest firms with the biggest reputations may sometimes take a step too far in the service of their clients' interests. So I've dealt with negatives, I've dwelt on negatives here, because I believe they suggest a significant and growing problem. It's important, though, not to forget the successes of our adversarial process and our lawyers. Uh, it was such an adversarial process that revealed, for example, the dishonesty of Jonathan Aitken, and the Levinson inquiry did much to expose wrongdoing at News of the World, and indeed some of the specific problems I've been able to discuss today. Nevertheless, I would argue we should not be too trusting about the benefits of the system. The profession in particular needs to think more actively about these problems and restrain its excesses. It's possible that the kinds of trust problems I refer to are bigger in those cases where the clients can afford to, if you like, lawyer up. It's here that professional value is most conflated with economic value. It's here that law is seen as a tool in the service of business, business rather than something that restrains it. it. It's here that legal problems are seen as things to be designed right, right around. Now, sometimes there are benefits from this. Sometimes it leads to innovation, efficiency, even possibly economic growth. Sometimes, however, it leads to poor practice, wildly high legal costs. One of the consequences of this uh, uh, adversarial uh, uh, approach is, if, uh, is that um, everybody has to lawyer up to cope, cope with the increasing complexity and uh, uh, imagination of the lawyers in dealing with um, uh, the law and evidence. Uh, and as we've seen, it may lead to much more serious uh, problems around probity and so on. It's also here where the professional rules and scrutiny is probably weakest. Regulators are more timid and the rules are more silent. It stands in contrast to ordinary cases, if you like, Joe Public getting representation from a lawyer, where the problems are more likely to be quality of lawyering and the funding provided by, in particular, the government through the legal aid scheme. Sadly, uh, funding is likely to be cut here again. So finally, it's in everybody's interest, I would say, that lawyers can be trusted and that lawyers deserve that trust. That needs greater attention to risks involved in going too far to dig a client out of a hole. It involves genuinely putting the public interest in the administration first. It involves, if you like, lawyers paying serious attention to this part of their code of conduct, which says that where there is a conflict between the client's interests and the public interest in the proper administration of justice, it's the public interest, not the client interest, which comes first. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I do apologise. There isn't time for, for questions. Um, we do have to exit the, um, the room at five minutes to uh, two. Um, so, therefore, I, I just want to thank uh, uh, Richard Moorhead very much indeed um, for, for his lecture, um, raising, uh, raising questions that seem to be a growing problem, and even the lawyers themselves uh, are recognising it's a, a growing problem, problem of trust. Um, the problem with the word trust is it's usually followed to do what, um, and that needs careful attention. Anyway, um, uh, first of all, a, a thank you to uh, Richard. Thank you.